Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. I am reminded of what Paul said to young Timothy. Paul was getting ready to end his ministry, and he said, preach the word, fulfill your ministry. He said to convict, rebuke, and to exhort people. And then he says there's a time coming when they will not put up with sound teaching. They will turn over to fables and legendary material rather than focusing on the truth of God. And we see a foretaste of that today in our study from the Gospel of Matthew. We saw last week that Yeshua on the Sabbath day, he brought about restoration to a man. He shows us the truth of the Shabbat. He shows us how the Shabbat foreshadows what we can expect in the kingdom of God, a kingdom of wholeness, what truly salvation is about, that how God deems things should be, there will be a restoration to his perfect will. And it was so sad that the religious leaders of that time were opposed to him to his truth, to his work, to the good things that he brought about. Unto the extent, as we saw last week, after this wonderful miracle that brought about the praise of, of that synagogue, the leaders went out defiant. They went out angrily, and they took counsel together to see how they might destroy him. And it's with that that we begin our study today. So take out your Bible and look with me to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 12. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to begin in verse 15. We read here in this verse, but Yeshua, knowing their, their intent, knowing this plan, it says, and he withdrew from there, but many crowds followed after him. And again, I emphasize this previously, just as it's a great multitude, but we read many crowds. Now, what is the implication of this statement? Well, we are led to conclude from this that he was touching many different communities, many different individuals from different backgrounds. And this is what we need to realize, that the word of God, it penetrates people. It doesn't matter what their race is, the color of their skin, what their cultural background might be, how they were raised up, what language they speak. When the word of God is proclaimed, when the power of God is demonstrated, true people take note of this. And when I mean true people, people who are truly seeking God, who wants what God has promised. They want this restoration. They want God moving in their life. They want truth to be the foundation of their life. When they see truth and the power of truth, they respond. But what's so sad is that these leaders did not. They wanted to destroy him. So we read again in verse 15, But Yeshua, after knowing, he withdrew from there, and many crowds follow after him. And notice what it says in the verse 15. 
and he healed them all. They were demonstrating a commitment. They were following after him. And what the scripture is telling us is very simple to understand. It was their allegiance, their following after him that caused them to experience this restoration, to begin to experience God's will being set forth in their life. Let me ask you a question. Does that interest you? Are you interested in God setting forth his order, his will in your life? That you experience restoration, but that restoration comes with a purpose. That you are restored to what God wants you to be so that you can do the things that he wants you to do. See, an immature person, one who is not walking in faith, what are they consumed with? What is their objective? To find out how I can get God to do what I want him to do. That is not spirituality. That is not someone who understands the revelation of God's word. That is a selfish person who is embracing a, a pagan form, an idolatrous form of, of the so-called Christian message. Don't be deceived. Be individuals that experience God's restoration, his power, and his order in your life. So we read, and he healed all of them. Look now to verse 16. And he, and this is a word for charging them. It's even a word of rebuking. He knows what, what they are likely to do. And he tells them, he charges them in order that they should not make him manifest. Now, what does that mean? Not make him manifest. Well, we've talked about this several times, that messianic secret, because there was a confusion. Many people only expected a Messiah. They did not read all of the prophets. They only emphasized, they only remembered those prophetic statements about a Messiah that would destroy their enemies and to restore their kingdom to Jerusalem and that Messiah would be their king, a victorious king and a blessed kingdom. That's all they were thinking about. They ignored the numerous prophetic verses that speaks about him coming, not initially to establish his kingdom, but in order to deal with sin and to bring about a spiritual restoration, to cause him, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to rule in their life first before he ruled throughout all of creation. They were ignoring that, so Messiah says, shh, don't tell people yet who I am. I want them to understand the additional, the primary, the first purpose of Messiah. So he warned them, he charged them not to make him manifest quite yet. And then we read why, verse 17. So that the word through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled saying. Now here again, we see something. We see over and over in the new covenant how Messiah, how he spoke of himself, who he is, what he's doing, what he will do. It's all based upon prophetic revelation. And that's why, and I say this often, but it's so true. That's why it is extremely unfortunate. It brings about sadness because people are ignoring prophetic truth. They don't have a prophetic understanding what's important to Messiah, why he came the first time and what he's coming back for. And when we don't understand prophetic revelation, my friend, I will promise you that you will be confused in identifying the ways of Messiah. And therefore, we have here prophetic truth. 
He says, all of this came about in order that the prophetic word that came through Isaiah the prophet. Now, why Isaiah? Why is he being emphasized opposed to some other prophet? The answer is very simple. Isaiah spoke frequently about Messiah as that suffering servant, that one who would lay down his life, that one who would come humbly, not in a bold manner as he will when he returns. So once more, in order that the word through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled saying, verse 18, behold my servant. Now, this word we came into contact with a few weeks ago. It is the Greek word pious, and it means a, a young man who is a faithful servant. Remember I told you about how today there are those who are deceived, those who are, and there's really no other word to use, those who are wicked, deceitful liars. And these are the ones who are saying this word pious means a, a young man who is in a homosexual relationship with an older man. That is a false statement. It derives from the pit of hell. It is an abomination, and it is blasphemy to say this. Now, this word speaks about a faithful servant. It can also be used as a synonym for a son. So when we look at this, it speaks about Messiah being prophetically the son of God and this faithful servant. That's what he wants to say. So once more, verse 18, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved one in whom my soul. Usually that phrase is well-pleased, but it's a word. To discern something as good. So when God the Father evaluated his only begotten Son, he saw that everything that he did was good. And what does that mean? Well, so frequently I share. The word good means in accordance with God's will. So what we learn is simply that Messiah did the will of God, and he did so perfectly. Now, look at some other things that it says concerning Messiah here. We read that God will, middle of verse 18, I will put my spirit upon him and judgment to the nations he will make known. Now notice that. It's future. It's not speaking about what he came to do the first time, but this is the one who is going to set things in order. He is not just the king of kings, the Lord of lords, but one of the words that is used frequently to describe Messiah is that he is the judge. As we see in the scripture, the word of God reveals that all matters of judgment have been given to the Son. So I will set my spirit upon him and judgment to the nations he will proclaim, verse 19. And, and this is the word quarrel, to be uh, quarrelsome, he's not going to be, nor... And this is word to yell out. And what it's speaking here is that Messiah, the first time he comes, and of course we're speaking of Jesus Nazareth, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. When he comes the first time, he's not coming in some bold, some vivid, some boisterous matter. No, it says here that he will not be quarrelsome and he will not uh, yell out, nor will someone hear in the streets his voice. He's not calling attention to himself in some, some loud way, but rather he comes softly. He comes humbly. He comes not calling attention to himself with words, but rather in deeds. He quietly manifests, and here's the key, the power of God. And he does so by utilizing this power, which is his own, 
in order to bring about restoration, to restore things to the will of God, the order of God, and the purposes of God. That's how the Spirit of God works in the believer's life. So he comes humbly, quietly, and such. And then we read, look at verse verse 20. A reed, and this is something that grows uh, along the, the sea banks, the river banks. He says, a bruised reed he won't break, and a, a smothering wick he will not extinguish. He's not coming to do these, these mighty things that's going to bring about some great change in the world. No, he's coming first to bring about, and here's the key, a great change in your life. He can change people's life, and the world doesn't even take notice of it. But the world can take notice of a changed life, your changed life. You can make a difference. But that difference is only going to be manifested when you stop trying to accomplish what you want, what seems right in your own eyes, and you begin to submit to the truth of Scripture. So he's coming quietly. He is not going to bruise a reed or break one. He's not going to extinguish this, this wick that is, is smothering. It says here, until, until, and this is important, look at the end of verse 20, until he should cast. Now, this is the word to do something in a major way, to cast something. It's not something that just is uh, uh, quietly done, but it's boldly. Until he should cast for victory, and here's the key, judgment. Did you hear that? He is going to cast boldly victory. This has to do with his second coming. See, the scripture says, for example, in John chapter 3, that Messiah did not come the first time to judge or to condemn the world or anyone else. He came in order that the world might be saved. That means every person potentially can respond to the gospel. But when he comes back again, he will come back in a bold way, in a way that will bring about world change. And that is going to be to establish victory. Victory is connected to the word salvation and kingdom. And he's going to do that. Notice how verse 20 ends by means of judgment. Verse 21. And in his name, the nations, here again, broad, not just Israel, not just few nations, but in his name, the only name given to men and women by which they must be saved. No, in his name, nations will what? They will hope. And that's so encouraging, this hope. Realize something. Biblically speaking, hope is always, always, always connected to the promises of God, the scriptural promises of God. So we hope in the things that the word of God reveals to us. We don't hope in simply what we want, what we think would be nice, what our mind and imaginations can, can conjure up. That's not hope. That's a wish list. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people like the patriarchs, that were moved to behave faithfully because they were pursuing the promises of God. And where do we find such promises? Well, the answer is simple. We find them in the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 22. No sooner does he teach a little bit that we see a miracle taking place to confirm his teaching. Verse 22 then they brought to him a demon-possessed one. See, his battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, authorities, in high places in the world of darkness. So they brought to him one who was demon-possessed, and he was blind and mute. And what did he do? No problem. He healed him. 
Now, this is why he came the first time, to bring individual healing to people, people like myself and people like you. And it didn't matter what the problem was. With God, all things are possible. So it says, they brought to him one who was demon-possessed, blind and deaf, and he healed him so that the blind one and the mute one he spoke and saw. And notice the outcome, verse 23, the crowds, all of them. Didn't matter what their background was. Each of these groups that were following him, they were amazed. All the crowds were amazed, and they said, is this one not, here's the key, the son of David. They recognized through these miracles that in fact he was the promised Messiah, the prophetic Messiah. These are things that the King David, I'm speaking of the King David, the son of David, Messiah, that the son of David, Messiah, would do. Verse 24, but once more, but the Pharisees heard this, they said, notice what they do. They have to try to discredit that which is God honoring. What were the people doing? The people were praising God. They were praising God, but these Pharisees, they said, this one, he cast out demons. They couldn't deny that the demons went out. But they said, this one casts out demons. How? He does so by means of, literally it says, except in Beelzebub, the prince or the ruler of demons. Now, now hear this. They said this one cast out demons. Yes, he does, but he does so in, because he's in relationship with Beelzebub, who's a term, it means literally the Lord of the flies, speaking about the, the, the disgusting nature of, of Satan, the Lord of the flies. So they try to discredit Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, by saying, He's in cahoots. He's in a relationship with Satan. Verse verse 25. But Yeshua, he knows all things. Yeshua knowing, and here's the key, their thoughts. Now, this word for thoughts means it's rooted in a word for desire. The, The desires that one thinks in. So Yeshua knew not just what they were thinking, but the motivation, their desires, and their desires were for themselves. Knowing their desires, he says, how can a kingdom be divided against itself and not be destroyed? And every city and house that's divided against itself, it it shall not stand. And if, verse 26, and if Satan casts out Satan, Unto himself he shall be divided. How therefore will his kingdom stand? And if I in Beelzebub cast out demons, what about your sons? Now it's speaking about those who were part of this same group, but they were in fact, they were in fact fighting against these demons. These spirits, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they weren't. But there were some. Here again, part of the leadership. And they were doing spiritual battle. So he says, if if I do that, what about your sons? In whom do they cast out? And the meaning is demons. On account of this, they, notice, on account of this, they will become your sons judges so it speaks about how these ones who are battling demons using the word of god casting out demons by the truth of scripture how they will be the judges of these false teachers verse 28 now he says something that's that relates to himself but not if but since but since i in the spirit of god cast out demons, therefore the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
Notice always how there's that emphasis in the kingdom of God. He's telling, I am bringing access to you, before you, that you can become a kingdom people. And the only way, and hear this, this is based in prophecy, the book of Jeremiah. The only way that you can become a kingdom people is through a kingdom covenant. And that kingdom covenant is the new covenant, a covenant of forgiveness of sins, a covenant of an interchange where God writes his words, writes his commands, writes his truth upon the tablets of a heart. That's what Messiah came to do the first time. That's what, that's what the ministry of the Holy Spirit brings about. So he says, but since I in the Spirit of God cast out demons, therefore the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then he writes, he teaches, how did I cast out these demons, he says. Or how is one able to enter into the house of a strong one and plunder his possessions, if not first, he binds that strong one, and then his house he's able to plunder. Then we read verse 30. And what he's saying here is that he's stronger than the enemy. That's how he takes these demons out of individuals, exercise those who are demon-possessed. Verse 30. But if those who are not with me, he says, verse 30, 30, but the ones who are not with me, they are against me. And the one who does not gather up with me, this one is going to be scattered. So he teaches here that there's only one choice. You are going to make one decision, and what is that? Either to be with him or you're against him. There's no position in between. You are either going to be gathering up souls for the kingdom of God with him, or you are going to be scattered. That means cast out from the good promises of God. See, this scripture, it's not difficult to understand. The word of God is straightforward, and that's why. It's not a question is, do I understand this? But the question is, am I going to humble myself? Am I going to implement this truth in my life that I might be found faithful and become a servant of the living God? To do so means you enter into a spiritual battle. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.